Hello ladies and welcome to the NJDAR Sews 18th Century Petticoats Workshop. I'm Pat, this is Adrian, and we're going to get you started on this exciting project. So I know you've all got all of your supplies and your fabrics on our raring to go, so we're going to show you everything you need. Um, it's going to be really easy and you can either machine sew or hand sew this, so it doesn't matter what your skill level is, just whatever you are comfortable with. And here's the good news. There are no zippers involved in any of these projects. Indeed, there's hardly any hardware at all. Uh, actually, what we're going to use to close our petticoats is one inch ribbon. And you don't even need that for right now, but we're going to gather our supplies. So let's get going, okay? Hi ladies. So we are going to get started and our, the things we need to gather together include your measurement sheet, some measuring tools, your bum roller pagne, the one inch ribbon, and the fabric for your skirt. Oh, but don't forget your scissors too. So first let's look at your fabric. If it's a solid colored fabric, you can kind of just pass by this whole section. But, or if it's a, a fabric that has a tiny and very intricate print. Because what we're gonna talk about now is matching our patterns so that it looks beautiful when it's put together, like matching wallpaper. So this kind of tiny print, there's a seam here, right there, and it's almost invisible to see because the print itself is so tiny that your eye is not drawn to the, the seam itself. However, if you're working on a bold print like this or on a plaid like this, anything that isn't lined up right is lined up wrong. So I'm going to show you an example of a finished piece. This is a petticoat that I've had for many years. A very busy pattern. But if I hadn't matched perfectly along that seam line, making sure that each and every arcade and rose was lined up, it would have looked like bad wallpapering. We don't want that. Okay, so let's show you how to match a pattern. Okay, ladies, this is a very bold print. Now, I personally can't wait to make this into a jacket. So, I know I'll be needing to match this print boldly around my body. For petticoat, it's the same thing. Like I said, it's like matching wallpaper. If it doesn't match, it's wrong. So we work off of the inside of fabric. So we're going to ignore this pretty outside and go to the inside and let that show. Now, wouldn't it be nice if this edge perfectly matched this edge? Well, let's look. Does it? No, sad to say it does not. So we're going to need then to, back to working on my right side of the fabric, or the inside of the fabric, fold over an edge so that I can work from that. So I'm just going to put a hard crease on this edge here. And now we will try to match it to the other side. So where will it match? So it doesn't match there. It matches here. Can you see now that that pattern is contiguous all the way up and that all of our little pieces match together? Now, having put in this hard crease here, that's where my seam line is going to be. It's going to match exactly where it's sitting on top. So I will fold out that card crease. And oh, by the way, another tool very handy to have on hand are pins. And I'm going to pin in that hard crease line in order to make my patterns match. So that's how you make a pattern match Adrian, can you help us with the plaid? I can indeed. 
I have here two pieces of wool. Let's spread this one out to make it a little easier to see. So as you can see, my wool is not the same in both directions, but it does have a very distinct pattern in it, especially with this very dark brown line. If we look at it this way though, there's also another pattern going on with I've got my blue line here and then a yellow line and then blue and yellow again, as well as these stripes are different too. So when I'm matching my other piece to it, I wanna make sure all of those line up. So, I've got blue here, yellow here, blue, but this does not match this. So I'm gonna slide this until I find that set. And this is where I'm gonna go. I'm gonna line my fabric up too. And when I'm sewing it, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sew right down this middle line here in the plaid. Put a couple pins in so you can see. And you can fold it back and let yep. them see it. Mm -hmm. So that way when I open this up and it gets pressed, these stripes continue in pattern across my seam as well. Now with both of our fabrics, you will notice that there is a fair amount of what honestly is lost fabric. This is not going to be in this petticoat pattern because what's more important is the matching of the plaid than this amount of loss. Now in 18th century land, that's not a bad thing because lost fabric like this is often used for trimmings or it's maybe used for small accessories to go with a garment. So even though it breaks our heart and our fabric is not as wide as a result of this loss, it doesn't matter a bit because we will utilize it in some other way in the future. Okay? Now we've looked at our fabric and now we need to think about how to cut the garment out. Now, you've asked me, a number of you, how much fabric do I need for a project? Well, it really depends on you and on what you want. I can say that in the TV show Outlander, some of those gowns has a, have as many as 15 yards of fabric in them. Please don't do that. It's more fabric than you'll ever need. Looks great on screen, but the practicality of it is insane. So, think of them as panels. We're going to make panels of fabric as high as you are from the waist to the floor and as wide as the fabric is. Now, even in that, there is a huge amount of variation because if you buy cotton from Joann's, it's 40, 42 inches long, wide. If you buy wool, it's likely to be 60 inches wide, 20 additional inches that can be used around the garment that you're making. So, preference for me, if I'm putting together panels of cotton, I'll use three panels. Maybe if I want a lot of fullness, four. Preference for me, if I'm using wool, I'll use two panels. So, I'm a big girl. If you're a petite girl, chances are it's going to size down by one to, you, to your sizes rather than my sizes. Or even just half a panel. Or, or just half a panel. So, we have one other challenge. Now, we've talked about around the waist. Let's talk from the waist to the floor. Normally, this is not something that we worry about too much. You stand up, you put on the shoes, you measure to the floor, life is good. However, in the 18th century, they added one more challenge, and that was their pannier or their hip roll. So, now, rather than the fabric going straight down from your waist to the floor, 
it now has to arch over another thing and go to the floor and that adds inches to the length of your garment. So we're going to make sure that you have those measurements in your arsenal too. Shall we take some measurements now, Adrian? Yep. Thank you. Okay, ladies, now we've taken basic measurements. Now we want to really hone in on those skirt measurements we're going to need. All right, so to do this, we're actually going to take five measurements. So I'm going to start at center front and we're going to work our way around and we're going to go from past waist all the way to the floor. And she's doing this with her shoes on to make it easier to know how far off the floor we want the skirt to be. So we're 44 inches at the center front. The next measurement I'm going to take is from where her hip roll starts. And of course you wouldn't wear your hip roll on the outside. No, this it would be just underneath. an illustration. <laughs> so this is 46. Then at the side, we are at 48 inches. And then we're still at 48 at the side back. And then at the very center back, we're down to 46 inches. So the side, the side length is the longest, but that's not unusual because wider at the hips versus front and back is very common for the 18th century. So that's what we'd, we'd expect, that the side length would be longer than both the front and the back. It's all about the hips, girl. It's all about the <laughs> hips. So we are now going to get ready to cut fabric. But of course, I have to talk to you a little bit more. Now, my petticoat that I'm going to be cutting is a rather extreme example. It has a band at the bottom of a contrasting color. I want to make sure that when that petticoat is made, that that band sits flat and perpendicular or parallel to the ground perfectly all the way around. And those measurements that we just took are going to help me along that way. That center front, side front, side and side back and back measurement. Now, there was a lot of variation when Adrian took my measurements. Normally in the 20th century, if there's variations because of your behind or your hips, we may add on extra length on the on the hem of the garment. In the 18th century, they didn't do that. They kept the hem of the garment absolutely on the straight of the grain flat. What they did add on was at the top of the garment. So this is my waistline. This is where there's going to be that variation for the waist at the center front and at the side and at the side back and the, hip and the center back. Now, we need to think in terms of panels. Remember how I said that? We also need to think in terms of, hmm, the ladies didn't actually wear their gowns so that the skirt hit the floor. Well, maybe Marie Antoinette did. She but, couldn't afford to have them cleaned by someone else. Or she just wore them once. <laughs> we are more practical ladies, and so were those ladies in the 18th century. So they would wear their skirts a number of inches off of the ground. If you're a petite woman, three inches off of the ground is a fairly high amount. But if you're my height, five inches for me is, is my norm. If I wanted to make an even shorter skirt, I could have it as short as seven or even nine inches off the ground. All of that adjustment needs to be made in those measurements that we just took. So I made up a sheet for myself that has, this is just waist to floor chart for me. You can see that here I have my basic measurements that were taken by Adrian. Then I have a column for three inches, five inches, seven inches, and nine inches off the ground. But on each of those I've also, though I've subtracted, I've also added an inch and three quarters the inch for the waistband and three quarters of an inch for the hem. So once I have those measurements that I know I'm going to do, I'm going to do a five inch off the ground skirt. My longest measurement 
is 44 and a quarter inches. I'm going to rough cut my panels. None of my panels are going to be any shorter than 44 and a quarter. Actually, I'm going to cut them as much as 45 and a quarter so that I know that I can get my measurements out of here. So rough cut your panels and then join me back here and we'll do the waistband. Having rough cut our pieces, I'm now going to give you the biggest hint I can give you for my vast years of experience. Label them. This is the center front panel for my piece. This is the center front pin. And I have now labeled it, and I always am consistent to label on the right side of my fabric at the top of my garment. This sounds really stupid. It's very obvious with this, which is top and bottom. But this pattern gives you that hint. If you were, however, making a garment out of this fabric, which is very similar at top and bottom, very similar from side to side, if you are not consistent and give yourself that little hint of a label, you will be riding down a murky river with no paddles. So now we're ready to cut our waistband. So the first thing we want to do is go to our chart. And I see from my chart that my front at five inches needs to be 37 and three quarters inches long. Adrian is lining that up for me. 37 and 3 quarters, and I've put a pin in the center front. Now, I go to my side front, and it is... Put it up. Okay. I wasn't going to do that, but I will. Now, it happens that in 18th century gowns, there's usually a flat panel across the front. Mine is 8 inches. That's what works on me, and all of my gowns have 8 inches now. So... I will measure four inches away and make sure that that's a nice flat line four inches from the center front this way, four inches from the center front that way, making a total of eight inches. I will also look at my side front measurement and discover that yes, it indeed is the exact same measurement. And we will measure that up and, three quarters. and put a pin right there. Now, the problem is when we get to the side, right? So our side measurement is at five inches, 39 and three quarters. I've put a pin at 39 and three quarters there. You will notice, give me the stick, that this is not the same as that. And you will need to level that so that it is a perfect curve down from this point and up to that point. All right, all right, next step. Okay, ladies, we have now cut the top edge of our petticoat and you can see that the top edge is, is beautifully curved to match my measurements. And you can also see that miraculously my turquoise and gold gown has become a mauve and white stripe. Doesn't matter, just the next step. And I might as well make two petticoats out of different fabrics than one petticoat that I can't quite finish. So, now we need to do the side seams. I have pinned here along my side seams so that I'm ready to go. But in the 18th century, a side seam was where you accessed and got in and out of your garment. Your two side seams were left open at the top in order for you to get in and out. It's not like today where we have jean zippers going up the front and skirt zippers going up the back. The front and the back would always be perfectly smooth with fabric without an opening. So we need to leave a section open from the waist down about a foot and I'm going to put a cross pin so that I can access that and know exactly where that starting point is going to be. No stitching here, stitching from here all the way down to the hem. 
Now, we've talked about the fact that you can either hand stitch or machine stitch, and we'll go into that in a minute. But now that we have this opening, conveniently in the 18th century, they used that for a second purpose. Not only did you get in and out of your gown there, but you actually could access your pocket that way. They didn't have built-in pockets like we did. No, their pockets were actually a separate garment worn underneath the petticoat. And I can go in that slit from the petticoat and access my pocket now. Here's the slit. The pocket would be worn inside. And inside the pocket, you keep all those treasures that you really need. You keep your fan, you keep your car keys, you keep your water bottle, your cell phone, all those necessities that we need in order to live our lives for an hour and a half. So <laughs> let's get to stitching. Now, hand sewing. If you're hand sewing, you're going to start from your cross pin about 12 inches down from the top edge. You're going to make sure that you have a double thread, which means you're threading through your needle and you're pulling both ends of your thread so that they're equal. And then you're tying a knot at the bottom of the thread. Hopefully you know how to do that without me telling you. There you go. I'm using a contrasting thread now just so that you can see the stitches. Now, basic stitches, there are a number of them, but because this is pretty simple stitching, we're just going to do what's called a running stitch, which is the in and out and in and out. It's best if you can do about, oh, eight stitches per inch. That's my set of running stitches. I'm going to, after I do about four stitches, I'm going to go right back in the last hole and do a back stitch to lock them in place. Then I'm going to do another four stitches. When I push them over the tip of the needle like this, that's called stacking stitches onto my needle. And I'm going to pull through Again, make sure I don't get tangled up in that, in that pin. Make sure everything is flat. Then again, go in, back off that last stitch, and then do another series of four stitches. That's how you hand stitch. Now we're going to show you how to machine stitch. All right, machine stitching. Now what you need to do is make sure that your stitch length is at two or two and a half. That's two millimeters long. If you have a, a older machine, that means you need to put eight on it, eight stitches per inch. So you line up on your seam line. I remember we're starting at that uh, pin that indicates the pocket slit, the top of the pocket slip. We'll go forward a few stitches, back to lock them, and then just stitch away all the way to the end of your seam. That's all you need to do. Two seams like that on either side, and your side seams are done. All right, so You've cut your skirt, you've sewn your side panels, you've curved up the top of your skirt, your petticoat to make sure it'll sit right. Now we need to put the waistbands on. And I say waistbands because each skirt gets two waistbands. What we're gonna use for that is going to be some type of one inch or thereabouts ribbon or tape. Um, it's very easy to find grosgrain ribbon. This is a little narrow but a grosgrain ribbon, which is that, that ribbed one with a solid edge. You can find this at any type of sewing store or even craft stores, um, very easy to find. This one is made out of 100% polyester, so as an added bonus, you can just take a lighter and lightly melt the ends and then they won't fray as well. There's also this type of grosgrain, which is also called Petersham ribbon. This is a cotton, mostly cotton and rayon, and it, while it is ribbed the same way, it's got the wavy edge to it. So 
This you won't necessarily find at a place like Joanne's, but you can find it online. Another option that you can find at Joanne's is twill tape. This is a very light polyester twill tape. It's found with the other trims and bias tapes and things like that at a Joanne's. Or, and this is my favorite, cotton twill tape. As you can see, I buy it in bulk. <laughs> <laughs> I used it a lot for a lot of different things. One thing to keep in mind is if you are buying a twill tape, you want it to be lightweight. You can also find belting in either cotton or polyester at Joann's, but those are generally really thick because they're not meant to be tied. This, basically whatever you want to use, needs to tie into a fairly small knot. If it's really hard to tie into a knot, you don't want to get that. The other things you absolutely do not want to get are either a sheer ribbon because it will eventually fall apart or a satin face ribbon, so the shiny ribbons, because those will not stay tied and you definitely don't want your petty to coat to fall off while you're walking down the street in a parade. <laughs> All right, so you've picked out what you want to use for your waistbands. Now you need to cut the pieces for it. And what you need is for each one, and remember we're, we're doing two of them, you need your full waist measurement plus 24 to 36 inches because you want to be able to tie each one around your waist. I've already cut this one off of my spool, so it is my full waist measurement plus enough to make a, a tie. First thing we're going to do is we're going to fold it in half and mark where the center of the tape is. And I've already got my pin to mark that here. Now, this is only going to attach to half of your petticoat, so the next measurement we need is half of your waist plus one inch. Each of these are gonna be an inch longer than half of your waist because you want your petticoats to overlap just a little bit at the side. This will help make sure you don't get any gaps there and it'll just look better visually. So these pins out here, these mark where my half Half of my waist is plus my extra, which I think it's a little over an inch because otherwise I would get a half inch measurement when I divide in half. So that is these two outer pins. And then because I'm going to be working on the front here, I've got a couple extra pins marking where I don't want to put any pleats into my skirt. Let's see, remember the flat part that this we part? showed before? That's yeah. what she's that's, talking about. That's going to be this in the center here. So. Now, you heard me say pleats. I promise these are not gonna be scary pleats. We are going to use a super easy pleating method. Uh, if you're using a striped fabric, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this because stripes are great because you can use them to make repeating pleats and use the stripe itself to figure out where to put your pleats. But for pretty much everything else, use this. It's super easy. And it's called divide and conquer. So. I've got the front of my petticoat and I've got my waist tape. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find my center of my front. Which I've told you to label so that you can find it really easily. But I didn't have a pin waiting in it for me, so. We're just gonna fold it in half and find the center front. And I'm going to pin my tape onto my center front with my tape on the outside of my petticoat. And then I'm also going to pin, just keeping my fabric and my tape completely flat and together, I'm going to add in my two little side pins here. And then I'm going to come over here to where my pocket slit is and I'm going to pin that to this edge, to this pin here. Now this petticoat is slightly different than the one Pat showed earlier in that my side seam or my pocket slit is not in a side seam. 
instead I just cut right into the fabric straight down and I also added a little thread bar while I was hemming my edges because you don't want raw edges on your pocket slits. Let's see if I can get this flat. And if you look closely, you can see this little thread bar right here that I made in this as well. Another thing you really don't want <laughs> when you're wearing your petticoats is you don't want to catch this on a doorknob and make it tear down further into the petticoat. Which it will do. Trust me, I've done that before. Mm -hmm. It's not fun. And you rolled just a tiny yes. little hem. Yeah, I did just to a finish tiny that little edge. Hem. Because so I, the do, pocket I, yeah, doesn't get anywhere on the fabric as you yeah. lift your hand in and out. Because I don't want that to fray out further either. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's just a tiny little hem. All right, let's start dividing. So I've got my tape here, and then I've got all this fabric that's gonna get pleated into it. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fold in half, matching my two outermost pins. I'm gonna find the center of my tape the center of my fabric, and I am just going to bring the two together. Center to center. And I'm going to pop a pin right in there. And I'm gonna keep doing that until I run out of fabric. So fold to ma match my pins together, fold again, center to center and add a pin and you can keep doing this as many times as you like for something as light as this cotton I want to have small pleats I don't want to have really big pleats so I'm going to keep dividing And the other thing that's really great about this is you always end up with the same number of pleats from side to side because you're always just dividing in half and you're not gonna end up with an odd number of pleats. This will be even. All right, so as you can see, I've now made four little sections. They're not perfect. But don't worry about it. 18th century pleats weren't perfect either. <laughs> <laughs> so once I have this done, I would do this for the entire section here. Then comes the pleating part. So I'm going to turn it to the inside. See how I've got these little loops of fabric sticking up here? These are what are going to become my pleats. So I'm going to tug them all the way to one side so that I've got fabric flat against the band and then just fold it back over itself. And just do that until I get all of those pinned down. They're kind of like they're lying flat right against the band, right, Adrian? Yes. So, let me show with a slightly bigger section of fabric so it might be a little easier to see and half once. Oops, needle won't work. <laughs> okay, so as I said, here's my big loop of fabric that I want to pleat. I'm going to pull all the way to the side until I get this lying flat against my band. And then I'm going to pinch right next to where my pin is. So I have this loop that I've now pinched flat. I'm just gonna fold it back over itself. So it's three layers of fabric, which then create a pleat. So that is how you do divide and conquer pleating. Okay, so once you've got all of your pleats pinned into place, what you're going to want to do is sew them down. And again, this can be done either by hand or by machine. It's up to you. I have already done that on the back of my petticoat. 
And I have done two lines of stitching as well. I've done one, which is a little bit easier to see, which is about a quarter of an inch away from the, ed the bottom edge of my tape. And then I've got a second line of stitching that is as close to the edge as I can get that. And this is just to help stabilize the seam and make sure that in the future, it doesn't start to pull out from the waistband because you definitely don't want this escaping. And there's a lot of stress on waistbands too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you step on a hem, there's lots I've, of things I've, that happen. Especially if you are sitting on the floor and then try to get up, because <laughs> I have stepped on my skirts many times doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so once this is done, there are two ways to finish this. This is a very lightweight cotton. So what I'm gonna do is fold the entire tape into the inside and then stitch it down. This can be, you can either tie, top stitch it with your machine, although your stitching will show, or you can go from the inside and just very lightly catch it by hand and then it won't show up anywhere near as much. Now, I've got a bunch of fabric here that I don't want sticking out. So I'm gonna trim it down a little bit. I'm gonna try to aim for trimming down only about a quarter of an inch or about half of what's here. I highly recommend if you have them to use pinking shears rather than regular scissors to trim this down. It'll help keep it from fraying out. Or you can use fray check, which is something you can find at Joann's or, or Michael's or any kind of craft store which is basically a, a really, really liquidy glue that you apply to fabric to help keep it from fraying as well. So, as I said, once that's done, either fold it fully in and stitch it, or perhaps you're using a slightly heavier fabric, like I've got, this is a petticoat I'm working on out of what is called a matte lace fabric, which is basically an imitation quilted look. This is super heavy, so once it's pleated and made, three layers of fabric here. I then don't want to fold it over again, making six layers of fabric in my waist. So for this, finishing this, I would again trim down my excess fabric and then just fold the tape in half over the cut edge. And that'll reduce the bulk at the waist. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So as you can see, lovely half pleated, half of my petticoat waist. So we've only got one step left, which is hemming, and I'm gonna pass it back over to Pat for that. Okay, I think we I've allowed for three quarters of an inch of hem. And you might think, if you're from the 20th century, that's not very much hem, because <laughs> we put two inches of hem on most things. But in 18th century, the wind is actually part of the friendliness of our, our wear. And so for a lightweight hem that can be caught by the wind, it's a beautiful thing. So in order to do a three quarter inch hem, what I'm going to do is flip up this edge. I'll finger press it. Just like this, using my fingernail to press it down. I will flip it up on itself one more time and even if I took out my tape measure right now and measured you, it would say three quarters of an inch. Trust me, baby, trust me. <laughs> you are gonna pin that all the way around, just like that. Up three eighths of an inch, up three quarters of an inch. All the way around, and you're gonna have that hem go the entire length. Once you've finished that, pre-pinning it, you will stitch it. There are any number of hem stitches. If your mama taught you one, it will work. Uh, you need only use a single thread this time rather than a double thread. Put a knot at the end of your long tail of your single thread. I, I do a cross stitch. So I have a stitch that comes here. I catch just a tiny bit from the top surface because I don't want it to show on the right side of my fabric. Then I move over about a quarter of an inch and take a nice little bite out of my pre-folded hem. Move over another quarter of an inch, take a little bite out of my top surface. Move over another three, uh, a quarter of an inch, take a nice bite. 
like I said, if mama has taught you a different stitch, mama's stitch is just as good. You don't need to use my stitches if mama's stitches are yours. So you're gonna do that all the way around. Now, even though I'm using a contrast fat uh, thread, you can still see that it hardly shows on the surface. So that's why you try to take as little bit of a stitch on the outer surface so it doesn't show when it's done. Once you've done that, baby, you're ready to get dressed. And we're gonna show you how to do that now. All right, so you can do a lot more than just make the plain petticoat. Um, you see all kinds of decoration on all kinds of petticoats. Pretty much the only ones you wouldn't see a lot of decoration on would be very plain wool or perhaps linen petticoats. Or quilted. Quilted is decorated, but it's self-decorated. Right. Whereas the petticoat I'm wearing is just a plain linen one, so I didn't add anything else to it. This one that we've got right here has this very lovely little flounce at the hem. And one thing that is really important with 18th century petticoats is the petticoat itself continues underneath the ruffle. This helps give the ruffle some stability and keeps it from collapsing in on itself. And yes, it is a really busy print, but it's all about excess and showing off sometimes. It, fabric was expensive. If you had extra fabric from cutting, remember how we had extra fabrics here and there? That would have been utilized. So. Think about if it's appropriate to put it on, if you really want to put in that extra work. But even once you decorate it, even once I put a pet a big flounce on, I still made it show more by putting a ribbon on to make it separate from the very busy print that it's sitting on. Yeah. And ruffles can be anywhere from really small like this one up to starting just about at knee length and down. You can make pretty much, like almost half of the skirt can be covered with ruffle. And you also see them going either way, all the way to the base of the skirt, or sometimes they'll stop a couple inches above the hem. That keeps them cleaner. <laughs> it does that too. Well, you've finished your petticoat. You've done the waistband, you've done the hem, you've done the side seams, you have the trimming put on. You need to know how to wear the darn thing. So we're gonna show you how to wear it. So first thing you do is you have a great friend, if she's available to help you. I, of course, live alone. So I'm always doing this on my own. You make, you slip it over your head or step into it if you can. Make sure the flat center part is in the center front. Now remember, it is big waistbands with ties on both the front and the back. It's kind of like putting on two different aprons. So I'm going to grab the back ties first. I don't tie them to the front ties. I tie them around my waist like an apron. You'll notice I tie them off center. That means I don't get one big bulk right here in the middle. I'm going to lift up my front section, and if you could help me sort that out fast. And, boy, this really goes with this jacket, doesn't it? Well, it's okay. We're just illustrating, right? So I tie a bow in that. Then I tip the bow underneath the waistband so that it doesn't show. Give it a nice tug so it sits nicely on my waist. And now you have your skirt on. You have your pocket slits available. And you're ready to go. Okay, so what do you do with your leftovers if you aren't trimming your petticoat with them? The 18th century, nothing gets thrown out. And when you do have scraps, especially if they're smaller ones, these are fairly big ones, but you keep your scraps and they're actually called cabbage. Cabbage can be used for a ton of different things, like stuffing your rump, if you want, or one of my favorite things to do, and that was really common, is this is a sewing kit. 
if it were folded a little better, it would actually fit in my pocket. It's a little dense at the moment. But this I made using a whole bunch of scraps of different silks that I had. And I have everything I need to sew in this. So each one of these is a pocket. I've got, let's see what I have in here. I've got, as you can see, I've got my pins and my needles here. I've got a little pair of scissors. I've got a little awl for making holes in things. I also have a couple of thimbles and some beeswax, which I use to condition my thread. As I said, I've got thread. I've got a couple different kinds of thread. I've got silk thread, linen thread. Then I've got some very narrow silk ribbon, a cotton tape, and this is a thread winder, again, with some linen thread. So this is the type of thing a woman would have on her at all times as well. And it's a great way to use up some little pieces of fabric too. And show off some of the really pretty things you've made in the past. Now we've finished your petticoat, we're gonna give you a preview of our next project. It's jackets! So we have two different styles of jackets. We have one that's very simple, basically an all-in-one, and one that has more pieces. So Adrian is featuring our all-in-one bed jacket, which uh, I'll take off my apron. she'll take off your apron and show it to you a little bit. So, so this you is just very basic. Um, there is one seam on either side and that is your underarm seam and then the rest is just finishing the edges so it is super easy to make and it's not very tightly fitted so you don't need to worry about maybe if you don't have stays or don't want to wear stays this is great because it doesn't need to be fitted over your stays my jacket however has five pieces so you go from very simple to hmm, that's a little bit more complex plus set sleeves so the sleeve is a separate piece that is put in, whereas hers are all cut into the fabric in one step. So my jacket is also fairly easy mm -hmm. as long as you've done set sleeves in the past. So if you like the more fitted version, which my jacket is a little bit more fitted, you can do my version and I will make available that pattern to you. If you want to do the easy one step version you can do that too both of them are legitimate both of them are beautiful they all work life is good so we can't wait until we meet you for the next hopefully face-to-face -face workshop and where we will specialize in jackets and you can remember to see us at our wordpress address that's njdar sews 250 250 at wordpress.com wordpress.com. Follow her. <laughs>